And as I dug deeper, I got more and more excited because it turned out that Spaz were basically a mashup of all the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of this video that I was into. Metal, punk, skateboarding, hip hop, graffiti, just smash it all up into one band and you had Spaz. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we're gonna go deep, so buckle up. This video is gonna be a monster, because if there's one scene or genre or moment in time that's inspired and informed who I am today, it's without question the 90s power violence scene, and that is exactly what this video is all about. For those who aren't familiar, power violence is the name given to a small scene of hardcore bands from California back in the 90s that played really fast, <laughs> really short songs. Basically, bands that sound like this, or this. Basically super fast, super short, super pissed songs that took what bands like DRI or Straight Ahead or Infest were doing in the 80s and took it to the next level. But what I want to talk about in this video is much more than just listing a bunch of bands for you guys to check out. This is not my attempt at doing any kind of like history of power violence because there's a lot of other people that could do that a lot better than I could. Because what I think is so special about power violence isn't just the music, but how it was this very like unique and forward thinking intersection of all the things happening at the time in 90s like youth and street culture. And in hindsight, it actually predicted a lot of what's happening in like 2018, 2019 culture, like a lot. So if that sounds interesting to you, then strap yourself in because like I said, I'm going to go deep. So let's get into it. Part one, setting the stage. In order to understand power violence, I think first you have to understand the time and place that it came out of, early 90s California. There's a lot of cool and sometimes scary shit happening in California at the time, all of which came together to form the breeding ground for power violence. Metal and hardcore had become thoroughly cross-pollinated thanks to the crossover bands of the late 80s, with Suicidal Tendencies being one of the biggest and most influential examples of that, along with the Bay Area thrash scene exemplified by bands like Violence and Exodus. Rap was taking over the charts, especially LA gangster rap, with Dre, Snoop, and Ice Cube leading the way. Skateboarding was also falling in love with hip hop, with rap replacing punk as the soundtrack of choice for a lot of skate sessions. The 1992 LA riots were still fresh, where tens of thousands of people rioted in reaction to police brutality. Graffiti was blowing up in a few ways. In Southern California, there was an epidemic of what they called tag bangers, who, as you might guess from the name, were basically graffiti writers with guns. And in the Bay Area, and up here in Seattle as well, skateboarders were starting graffiti crews like crazy. There were two skateboarder-centric crews that started around that time that are still pretty notable called US and BTM. So while all that stuff was going on in California, I grew up in a boring suburb of Seattle with friends and family members in California. So I wasn't really part of the action, but I was close enough to it that I was hyper aware of all that stuff and became obsessed with it. I was completely in love with hardcore, metal, graffiti, skateboarding, and rap. And that combination of things is actually what would also make me fall in love with power violence. I'll explain. Part two, how I discovered and fell in love with power violence. On the one hand, I loved hardcore bands like Black Flag, The Circle Jerks, and DRI for their lyrics and ideas, but the music wasn't as fast or brutal as I wanted it to be. And on the other hand, I liked death metal because it was fast and brutal. I was into the early earache and roadrunner bands like Morbid Angel, Cannibal Corpse, Deicide, all that stuff, but I couldn't really connect with it the way I did with the punk bands because guys in leather pants singing about demons and stuff was kind of cringy to me even as a ninth grader. But I finally found what I was looking for when I stumbled on it one day at a record store called Wicked music in Mountain Vernon, Washington in I think 92 or 93. And since back then there was no way to hear an album before you bought it, I would oftentimes buy stuff based just on the band name or the cover art. And that day, flipping through random records in the punk section, I found two that had logos and cover art that basically looked like brutal in a punk way and so I bought them. Those two records were Capitalist Casualties, The Art of Ballistics 7-inch and the No Comment Downsided 7-inch. And it was by pure dumb luck that I bought those, but holy shit, I could not have pick two better records to introduce me to the world of power violence. <laughs> Power violence, 
I didn't quite know exactly what it was, but I knew that I was hooked and I wanted more of it. So I looked on the back of the records and I saw that they were both put out by a label called Slap a Ham Records. And as some of you may know, Slap a Ham is the power violence label. It was started by a guy named Chris Dodge in 1989 and put out all the genre defining bands like Capitalist Casualties, Man is the Bastard, Crossed Out, No Comment, Infest, and Discordance Access, among many, many, many others. And as much as I loved the sound of those No Comment and Capitalist Casualties 7 Inches, and I still do, honestly, I just couldn't fully relate to everything they were talking about on those records because a lot of it was just very dark shit like addiction and mental health. You know, they had song names like Drinking Alone, Methamphetamine, and Drug Culture. Or you can see on the label of the No Comment 7 Inch, there's a picture of a slit wrist. Very dark stuff. And I was probably more familiar with this stuff than most 15 year olds due to basically my family history which has plenty of both of those things but still I just couldn't really fully relate to it at that point in my life. So the band that really did it for me and made me just go all in on power violence was Chris Dodge's band Spaz. They played the same kind of super fast pissed sounding hardcore as No Comment or Capitalist Casualties but with a vibe that I could get into as a 15 year old kid like they had songs about pizza and kung fu movies and BMX bikes and they're actually super friendly nice guys which isn't a surprise if you've ever seen the slap ham records ads and stuff that Chris made that were mostly illustrated with his like silly little cartoons. Totally different vibe from what you would find in any other kind of like extreme variant of hardcore at the time. And that combination of like really intense, brutal hardcore with a fun, lighthearted vibe was just absolute perfection to me. They quickly became my favorite band and I dug up everything that I possibly could about them. And as I dug deeper, I got more and more excited because it turned out that Spaz and some of the other bands in the power violence scene that I'll talk about later were basically a mashup of all the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of this video that I was into. Metal, punk, skateboarding, hip-hop, graffiti, just smash it all up into one band and you had spaz. Let me give you just one example of what I'm talking about, which are the lyrics to a song called MPS, which stands for Mongoose Preservation Society, which is a reference to the old Mongoose brand BMX bikes, if you're familiar with those. <laughs> The mongoose values must be preserved to have our metal thunder be moshed to and heard. To help us, this is what you must do. Recognize that KISS was the first black metal crew. And keep in mind, this was 1994. They were making black metal jokes years before basically anybody in America was even aware that black metal existed. That is some ahead of the curve shit. But what really blew my mind and really sealed the deal for me was when I found out that their guitarist Dan was also a DJ who had several hip hop projects with guys from some other Bay Area bands like No Less and Plutocracy. And on top of all that, he was even in the Graffiti Crew US. That's one of the crews I mentioned in the beginning of the video. If you're from the Bay Area, you may have heard of or maybe even seen seen the work of the most well-known member of U.S., a guy named Orphan. Rest in peace. Orphan just absolutely crushed San Francisco for 25 years, and when I was in high school, I spent hours and hours and hours trying to copy the style of all the guys in the U.S. So the fact that Dan was also into that style of graffiti, that he was in the crew that started it, just seemed too good to be true to me. And the best part is, it wasn't just spaz. There was a whole scene of bands like them in the Bay Area that were into all this stuff. Agents of Satan, No Less, Plutocracy. It felt like I just discovered discovered an amazing parallel universe where I wasn't the only person into all this weird shit. So I was like an overnight super fan of the band and I actually ended up becoming friends with them. They were a couple years older than me and I'm sure I was probably extremely annoying, but they were still super cool to me. I remember going down to San Francisco when I was 17 to see them play at Gilman and actually they ended up making a record about me a couple years later, which was extremely cool of them. And I'm happy to say that I still talk to these guys 20 years later. Spaz was definitely my favorite of all those bands, but there's a ton more that I would highly recommend you check out. Not all of these are Bay Area bands, but they're all kind of slap a ham related bands that are a part of this scene. No comment, downsided 7 inch. Man is the bastard. Crossed out. <laughs> Apartment 213. <laughs> and lastly, a band called Emetic. 
But Spaz and the other Bay Area bands weren't the only ones. Down south in the LA area, there was another group of bands who were equally ahead of the curve in their own way. If Spaz and Slapaham Records were the flag bearers of the Bay Area scene, Despise You and Pessimizer were that for the Southern California scene. What really put the LA scene on the map for me and I think a lot of other people was a double seven inch comp called Cry Now, Cry Later that came out on Pessimizer, which is a label run by Chris from Despise You. There's actually four of these Cry Now, Later compilations, and in my opinion, the first two are among the very best hardcore comps ever put out. They're just one fucking banger after the next. I'll get into some of my favorite songs in a minute, but the first thing that caught my eye about this was the packaging, which was this raw cut and paste mix of like cholo artwork, skateboarding imagery, metal graphics that honestly would look totally at home in the marketing materials for a 2018 streetwear brand. And that really struck a chord with me because it was basically the suicidal tendencies kind of thing updated for the 90s. Meaner, grimier, and more aggressive. And compared to the Bay Area scene, which had some darkness, but was mostly pretty fun, lighthearted kind of vibe, the LA scene was much darker and much more metal. Probably a reflection of what I talked about in the beginning of this video as far as the crime and racial tension in LA at the time and that Despise You were from Inglewood, which at that time was very much the hood. It's actually very close to where the LA riots kicked off. And looking at all the Despise You and Pessimizer stuff, I'm really kind of shocked at how much it predicted the current trend of metal meets cholo graffiti meets skateboarding. I mean, look at this Pessimizer flyer and tell me it couldn't be a hype streetwear graphic from 2018. Ironically, this would probably horrify Chris Elder, who started Despise You, put this record out and made this graphic because he's about as far from a trendy hipster as anybody could possibly be. Sorry, Chris, but I think you might be an accidental hipster. In any case, the Cry Now, Cry Later comps were the definitive document of the SoCal scene at that time, and I could do a whole video just about them because they are that good, and there's no way that I can do them justice here in this video. They're all worth listening to, but in my opinion, the second one is especially good. Here's a few standout tracks. Despise You. <laughs> Excruciating terror. <laughs> Dystopia. <laughs> Factoria de Miedo. And I have horror. And again, I could go on forever. There's no way I could list every band, so apologies for everybody that I left off. So that was a pretty deep dive on the early bands, but they were by no means the end of the genre. Which brings us to part number three, present day. Like I said, this video is not an attempt at the history of power violence or listing every band of the genre, and it's already long as hell, but I do want to talk a bit about where the genre went since I discovered it through Spaz, Despise You, and the other bands I just talked about. One of the interesting things is that power violence was never intended to be the name of a genre. It's kind of a goofy name, right? The origin of it is from a Man is the Bastard song called HSMP, where Eric Wood shouts this out. It was never intended to be a genre. It was just a phrase that Eric Wood came up with to describe some like-minded bands at one moment in time. And when it became a genre, that's when it became less interesting to me. To make a long story short, if the early years of power violence were basically outsider music played by people who didn't even fit into the rest of the punk scene, the later years are when, in my opinion, power violence became just another subgenre of hardcore. Instead of being a bunch of weirdos doing all kinds of crazy experimental shit that didn't really sound the same, but kind of sort of loosely belonged to the same scene because where else would it go? It just kind of became the label for bands who played short, fast, hardcore songs with a lot of sudden tempo changes. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but to me personally, that's not interesting for a couple reasons. First, I don't think any band will ever do that style better than No Comment, Crossed Out, or Despise You. And why would I want to listen to a less good version of those bands when I could just listen to the original band? It's kind of like when bands cover Rain and Blood. Like, why bother? There's no way you could possibly 
really ever do it better than Slayer did, right? But more importantly, the later bands that called themselves power violence were missing the cultural parts that made me fall in love with Spaz and Despise You. That fusion of punk, metal, skateboarding, graffiti, and hip-hop was a crucial ingredient to me. That these guys weren't just trying to emulate the sound of their friends' bands, that they were influenced by everything from suffocation to excel to New Deal skateboards to invisible scratch pickles and orphan, that is what was special about it to me. If it's just another band that sounds like a slightly worse version of the Infest 7-inch, it's kind of hard for me to get excited about that. That said, I am stoked to see that there are people who care about power violence in 2018, because to say that those bands were ignored back in the early 90s would be an understatement. They're definitely more popular now than they were back then by a long shot, and to me, I think that says a lot about how special and innovative those bands were, that it took people 10 or 15 years to catch up to what they were doing back in the early 90s. And although I may not be super interested in what power violence bands are doing now, being a part of the scene back in the day was, at the risk of sounding corny, a really transformational experience. It was the first time as a teenager that I felt like I had found my people. The first time that I didn't feel like I was isolated alone on this desert island, the only person into all this weird shit. And I'm incredibly grateful to have been part of that moment in time and for all the friendships I made at that time. And as far as the music goes, I still listen to all the bands I talked about in this video. And in my opinion, these releases hold up as some of the best fucking hardcore ever made. All right, guys, there you go. That's the story of how I personally discovered power violence, what it meant to me. And if you're into power violence, then hopefully this video made you think about it from a little bit of a different angle. It's really amazing to me to look back and think about how ahead of the curve this scene was in terms of predicting that whole mashup of like punk and metal and hardcore and skateboarding and graffiti and rap that's basically defined the last like several years of youth culture. I did make a Spotify playlist for this, but unfortunately a lot of the stuff I talk about in this video just isn't on Spotify, but if you're interested, check it out. There is a link in the description to that playlist. And lastly, before I sign off, I want to apologize to all the people and bands and labels and venues that I wasn't able to talk about in this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now. If you found this interesting or entertaining or informative, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. If you're already subscribed or for some bizarre misguided reason you do not want to subscribe, please like the video, leave a comment, share with a friend. Anything that you can do to help spread the word would be very much appreciated. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.